I have a basket of ropes, and if you were here last Sunday, you remember that we talked about these little ropes, and hopefully you kept this somewhere this week, and maybe you had to pull it out, and uh, maybe you stuck it in your Bible. And I'm going to set this basket here. If you were not here last week, I'm going to sit it here, and if you want to come up after service and get one of these little pieces of rope, this just simply represents our faith. And we talked last week, a new sermon series we began, about he is faithful, the faithfulness of God. And we're going to continue talking about that again this morning. And I passed these ropes out to you because I told you a little story about a boy flying a kite, couldn't see the kite, and a, a man walked by and said, son, what are you doing? He said, I'm flying a kite. And he said, well, I don't see the kite. I can only see the rope. And he said, well, I don't see it either. And he said, how do you know the kite's still up there? He said, every now and then, it pulls on me. And we talked about how every now and then, God, and if you were here last week, you remember this little simple illustration that I gave, that sometimes in life, you don't see God necessarily. You don't know where he's at. You don't know where he's at when you're lying in bed crying at 3 o'clock in the morning. You don't know where he's at when you're in the hospital room. You don't know where he's at when your kids have lost their minds and gone crazy. But every now and then, he gives you a little tug, and he just says, I'm still here. It's going to be all right. And some of you this week have had that little tug, haven't you? I'm still here. It's going to be all right. I'm still here. It's going to work out. I'm going to take care of you. I'm, I'm still here, even though you're lonely, even though you're hurting. I, I, I'm still here. And he tugs every now and then just to remind us. And that's all this little simple illustration is all about. And Micah Barnard, you play a great job being God for me every week sitting right there. So if you didn't get one of these little pieces of rope, would you pick one up after service? Just hang on to it. And when life is bad and you don't know what to do, and you say, God, where are you? Just take that out and say, God, I remember what the pastor said, and I believe you're still there, and I believe you're going to help take care of me. Well, this morning, we're going to continue in our sermon series, and we're going to be talking about how God is faithful to those who are defeated. It doesn't matter how long you have been a Christian. It doesn't matter how long you have served the Lord. There will be times in life that you feel defeated. There will be times in life that you wonder, am I doing anything? Have I accomplished anything? Am I doing any good with my life? Uh, have I done anything with my life? And I think the older we get, the more we tend to ask those types of questions. What have I accomplished? What have I done in life? And so I want to just talk about that for a little while this morning. If you have your Bibles, you may want to turn to the Old Testament book of Lamentations. And I want to say that ahead of time because that's one of those books that's hard to find in the Old Testament. So you just take your time and find the Old Testament book of Lamentations, and uh, we'll get in chapter 3 once you get there. And that's where we're going to stay focused at this morning is Lamentations chapter 3. I'm going to begin with a story. In 1866, in a log cabin in Franklin, Kentucky, Thomas Obadiah Chisholm was born. Although he never went to high school and he never went to college, he became an elementary school teacher at the age of 16. Five years later, he was named the associate editor of the Franklin Favorite, which was a local newspaper there in Franklin, Kentucky. He was 27 years old when he gave his life to Christ during an old-fashioned revival service, as we might call it today. In the years that followed, he served as a Methodist minister, and he also served as an insurance agent. And during his lifetime, he wrote over 1,200 poems and in 1923, he sent a batch of those poems to William Runyon. Now, William Runyon was a musician who was serving at the Moody Bible Institute at that time. And Mr. Runyon was so impressed with one of these poems that he put it to music and he had it published privately, not knowing in 1923 that it would become one of the most beloved hymns of the 20th century. Fast forward to 1954. How many were alive in 1954? Just slip up your hand. All right. In 1954, at a Billy Graham crusade, George Beverly Shea introduced the song that Mr. Runyon had put to music to London in the crusade. In 1941, Thomas Chisholm penned these words of personal testimony. He said this about his life. 
My income has not been large at any time during and any time due to impaired health in the earlier years, which has followed me on until now. Although I must not fail to record here the unfailing faithfulness of a covenant-keeping God and that he has given me many wonderful displays of his providing care for which I am filled with astonishing gratefulness. And I love the last phrase he uses there, astonishing gratefulness. Such should be the testimony of every child of God. The hymn that Thomas Chisholm wrote is from the Old Testament book of Lamentations, which we are going to look at today. Many of us in this room know the words to that hymn. He simply called it, Great is Thy Faithfulness. If you were here last Sunday morning with us, you know that we ended our service singing that great hymn that Thomas, Thomas Chisholm wrote based on Lamentations chapter 3. There is a paradox in the way that we use the hymn, Great is Thy Faithfulness. We tend to sing this hymn when we have experienced moments of God's blessings. I have heard it sung at weddings and at graduations. I have heard it sung at the end of a year when we look back over that year to see how God has led us and blessed us day by day. This beloved hymn has encouraged so many of God's people but it is based on a passage of Scripture that was written during one of Israel's lowest moments as a nation. Now, if you can think of the word lament and what that word implies, then you know what the book of Lamentations is all about. It was written by Jeremiah. Jeremiah is known as the weeping prophet because all he did was cry and talk about how bad and discouraging things were. There was hardly ever anything good that Jeremiah wrote about because everything was so bad. And so he wept and he cried and he lamented all the time in his writings. He sits there and he is looking out over Israel and Jerusalem and it has been destroyed. His mood is bleak as you read the words of Lamentations. His words are dark and they're almost angry because of what has happened to his beloved Jerusalem. His tone is almost a tone of total despair. And for most of the book of Lamentations, there is not one word of hope and not one ray of sunshine. And I wonder, has your life ever felt like that before? There has not been one sign of hope anywhere in the situation you find yourself in, and there is no ray of light shining through any of the dark clouds that are around you. And that is exactly where Jeremiah finds himself as he writes these words of lamentations. And then we come to our text. And in Lamentations chapter 3, around verse 22, the light slowly begins to break through. And what a challenge this is for all of us. You see, it's one thing to sing, great is thy faithfulness at your wedding, but it's something else to sing it when your husband tells you he's leaving you for another woman. It's one thing to sing, great is thy faithfulness when our children graduate high school or college, but it's difficult to sing this song when your child has been killed by a drunk driver. We will gladly sing the words, great is thy faithfulness, when the operation has been a success. But how hard is it to sing when we bury a loved one because the cancer treatments didn't work for them? See, the text we're going to look at today is not an answer to the mysteries of life. I can't tell you why it happened or why it doesn't happen and why it does happen sometimes. This text doesn't do that for us. This text is not about politics or the circumstances that we face every day. This text has nothing to do with intricate theology. But this text today, Lamentations 3, 22 and 23, is a direct word from God spoken through the prophet Jeremiah. And here's the word. It declares that he is our hope in the midst of our hopelessness that he is our light when all around us is darkness, that he is the way when we can find no way, and that he is our reason for living rather than giving up. There is a word from the Lord this morning for all of us, and it's contained right here in these two small verses 
that we're going to look at today. And I want to tell you this morning, I don't know where you are in life. I don't know everybody's problems. I don't know everybody's situations. And I don't know everybody's story by detail, by detail, by detail. But I do know somebody who knows all those things about us, and that is our Heavenly Father. And that's why we sing the songs that we sing. And that's why we talk about the things we talk about. He is our hope when there is no hope. He is our light when there is no light. He's the reason we keep going when we'd rather give up because he is a faithful God to us. He is a faithful God. And so in this text, there are four phrases contained in this text. And in those phrases, we find questions and then we find answers. I love it when the word of God does this for us because so many of us have more questions than we have answers. And we like to ask questions and we can't find answers to the questions that we have. But in this passage, in this text today, we ask questions, but now God is going to give us the answers to our questions. I'm going to ask you four questions and I'm going to encourage you to write them down in your notes this morning and take notes and, and, and take better notes than I'm even going to give you today. But write these questions down and then we're going to give you the answer. Here's the first question we ask many times. Why doesn't God destroy me? Why doesn't God destroy me? Now, this is not a theoretical question because we all walk closer to the edge than we think. There is a, a fine line between disaster and prosperity. There's a fine line that we walk between joy and sorrow. There's a fine line that we walk between joy and tears. There's a fine line that we often walk between life and death. There's a, a fine line that we often find ourselves walking on. Let a car swerve in front of you. Let a horse stumble that you're riding. Let a tiny switch malfunction and the whole plane crashes. Let a train jump the tracks. Let the brakes give way. Or let a small germ that you can't even see with your human eye enter your system somehow. And we all walk the line right on the edge closer than we often think we do. Who can understand the mysteries of the universe? Why are you alive today and someone else is dead? Why is it that you have been to so many funerals for other people and yet nobody has ever been to your funeral yet? Who can understand the mysteries of the universe. Here's the answer from Jeremiah. Because of the Lord's great love, we are not consumed. Why doesn't God destroy us? Because of the Lord's great love, we are not consumed. Why doesn't God destroy us? He could destroy us and he should destroy us. He could destroy us because he is God, and he should destroy us because we are sinners. So why doesn't God destroy us? And Jeremiah says, it is because of the Lord's great love that he doesn't destroy us. I love that Hebrew word and phrase for love in this verse. And it's the idea, if you want to write out in your notes, love, and draw a line and write this out, loyal love. That's what it's talking about. It is a loyal love love loyal love it is a love that will not let go because it is not based on emotion and it is not based on will that it's not based on that it's not based on emotion it's not based on if you treat me well i'll treat you well and if you love me i'll love you and if you don't like me then i won't like you that's emotion and you want to know why so many people have trouble in their life and their relationships, and not just husbands and wives and parents and kids, but in all kinds of relationships, friends and neighbors and coworkers and, and supervisors. You know what it is? We live our life based on emotion. Everything's emotion. When you get in your car or truck and leave here today and somebody cuts you off on the road, your emotions come alive in you. And you may want to cut them off. You may want to pull in front of them. You may want to slam on your brakes. You may want to not give your turn signal and get in front of them. It's all emotion. And God says, I love you, but not with an emotional love. Because an emotional love fades away. It's based on circumstances and what's going on around us. But God says, I love you with a loyal love. 
It doesn't matter what's happening around you, I'm still going to love you. doesn't matter if you fail me, I'm still going to love you. doesn't matter if you sin against me, I'm still going to love you. doesn't matter how many times you've messed up, I'm still going to love you. It's a loyal love, and that ought to make all of us feel good in here today, that God loves us with a loyal love. He could destroy us, and maybe he should, but he won't do it because he has a loyal love towards us. God loves us, and he has promised to love us, and nothing can make him break that promise to us. And that leads me to make this point this morning. As bad as things are or may be in your life today, if it were not for God, they would be much worse than they are right now. We'll say, well, well, Pastor, that's a bold statement for you to make because you don't know what's going on in my life. Yeah, but let me just say it again. If it were not for God, and if it were not for God's love, no matter how bad things are in your life right now, they would be much worse without God in your life. And I think we tend to forget that sometimes. That if it was not for the love of God, if it were not for the loyal love of God, we tend to go through life with a sense of entitlement. I deserve this, and I deserve that, and I've worked hard, and I have earned this. And you know what that does many times? It carries over into our prayer time and our prayer life with God, and we begin to talk to God, and we begin to think, you know, God, I've been so good, I deserve your blessings. I've, God, I've worked so hard for you. I deserve to have this in my life. And we carry that sense of entitlement right into our relationship with God. But when we pray like this and think like this, you know what it shows? How much we really don't understand the grace of God. I don't get anything because I deserve it from God. I don't get anything because I've been so good. I don't get anything because I've given my life to preach the gospel. I don't give anything because I've moved all over the country doing what I felt like God has called me to do. No, I get what I get, and I have what I have, and God blesses me with his blessings. Why? Because he is God, and he chooses to do that for me. Amen. Not because I deserve it, and not because I'm good, and not because I'm better than anybody else. God blesses me because he chooses to bless me just like he chooses to bless you in your life. Not because you deserve it. Then we come to our second question this morning. How do I know that God will keep loving me? How do I know that God will keep loving me? Jeremiah again gives us an answer to the question. He says, for his compassions never fail. His compassions never fail. Now, if you have your sermon notes or you have in your Bible the word compassion, maybe a little different, but the version we're using today, the NIV, compassions, I want you to notice the best part of that. The word compassions is in the plural form, not the singular form. Now, English is not my main study of, in school, but I do know the difference between singular and plural. And the writer says, his compassions, his compassions, never fail. God's compassion is in the plural. That means it comes in waves rolling down from heaven. James 5 and 6 said it this way. He gives us more grace, compassions, more, more than once, more than one time, more than in one time event. He gives us more grace. In John 1 16, John speaks of one blessing after another plural, not just one blessing, but a blessing after a blessing after a blessing after a blessing. God just keeps on pouring it on to us. I mentioned this earlier, but we do have many times a well-developed sense of entitlement. And along the way, we may have lost our sense of gratitude for our blessings. And I think it is especially true regarding the simple blessings that we receive every day. There are daily blessings that we receive from God that we just tend to take for granted. You all woke up this morning, didn't you? You did. Now, you may 
think more about that as the day goes on and as people talk about life and death. And we received an early morning phone call that someone passed away, a family member passed away from someone who attends our church. And so that person is really thinking about that today. They lost a family member. But you know what? We all woke up and we, we sat up and we put our feet on the floor and we got up and we went about our day. And how many times have we just taken that for granted? The alarm clock goes off, the phone rings, we jump out of bed. We just took it for granted. You were able to dress yourself today, right? And how often do we take that for granted? That I could put my arm in a shirt and in a coat and I could tie a tie and I could put my shoes on my feet and I could do all of that by myself. And nobody had to help me with that. And as I look around, we were all able to feed ourselves today, right? Nobody had to spoon feed us. Nobody had to cut our food up in small for the most part. And how many times have we just taken that for granted? All the, the daily blessings of God that we just take for granted. And, and it just, as I think about this, I think, God, help me to just be more mindful of things. Help me to be more appreciative of things. Help me to, to just look at these blessings and say, thank you, God, I was able to do that. Thank you, God, I could get out of my bed. Thank you, God, I could walk to the car. Thank you, God, I could pick up this book and I could mow the grass. Thank you, God, I could do all these things that we tend to take for granted on a daily basis. Some of you will remember the crusty old news contributor by the name of Andy Rooney, who was famous on 60 Minutes. And some of you are too old to even know, or too young to know what I'm talking about. And some of you are so old you've forgotten what I'm talking about. I don't know. And I don't know what I'm talking about half the time. But I loved Andy Rooney. He passed away. But he said this, and I just wonder, it's a long quote, but I want to share this with you this morning. It'll be on the screen. He said, for the most, most of life, nothing wonderful happens. If you can't find happiness in things like having a cup of coffee with your wife or sitting down to a meal with family and friends, then you're probably not going to be very happy. If you sit around dreaming about winning the big contract or hoping for the love of your life to call you up or wondering when the Yankees are going to make you their starting pitcher, you're going to spend most of your days waiting for something that isn't going to happen. And then he says this, meanwhile, meanwhile means while you're waiting for all this to happen, meanwhile, the sun will rise tomorrow and you won't see it. A friend will say hello and it won't matter. Your children will giggle but you won't smile. The roses will bloom and white snow will cover the front yard. Your husband will offer to rub your back. And because it's ordinary, or you've seen it before, or heard it before, or done it before, and because you're dreaming of the future, you'll miss it all together. Hmm. How blessed we are already. And how easy it is to forget what God has done for us. Why? Because we've seen it all before. We've done it all before. We've had it all before. God help us to look at every day as a new day, as a fresh day, and begin to count the blessings of God and recognize them and to thank God for those blessings in our lives. Here's the third question we can ask is when will God give me what I need? We all have needs in our lives, and when will God give them to us? And then Jeremiah gives us the answer to the question, when will God give us what we need? And he says, they, what is he talking about? He's talking about the compassions of God. The compassions of God are new every morning. Here's a word for fearful saints. God's mercies and God's compassions are brand new every morning. Every day you get up, there's new mercy and new compassion and new blessings for you. Every day, man, I just, every day for the child of God should be like Christmas morning for a child. God, what are you going to do today? God, how are you going to bless today? God, where am I going to see you today in my life? God, how are you going to use me today to bless someone else? God, what are you going to do today, God? Every day, his mercy, his compassion, and his blessings are new to us. Every day, Jeremiah says. If you read your Old Testament, you'll remember the story about the manna in the wilderness. God sent manna every day except on the Sabbath. And he told the people of Israel, 
Go outside your tents. Gather all the manna that you want to gather. Eat as much as you want to eat. It'll never run out. Take all you want. But don't store it up. Except on one day, you know what that day was? The day before the Sabbath. On that day, get a little bit of extra. Keep it in the tent because you can't go out on the Sabbath because that is a day of rest. And he told the people, if you store up the manna, if you try to hide it away and try to keep it for an extra day, the maggots will come, they'll spoil the manna, and it won't be any good. They were to gather it each day eat it that day, and then gather more the next day. Now, if you don't know that story, go read Exodus chapter 16, and you'll see all about it. But what God was doing in this process is he was teaching his people to trust him day by day by day for their daily needs. Now, let me stop here and interject this. At some point, they got sick of eating manna. And there was quail also that would come down sometimes. They got sick of it. Have you ever thought of it? They got sick of the blessing of God. And I wonder, have we ever gotten sick of the blessing of God? I don't want that. And God, I wish it was this way. And God, I wish it was that way. And God, I wish you had done this. And and God, why did you allow that? Why? He is God. He is the blesser. He is the one who gives mercy and gives compassions. And yet I wonder if we aren't like the spoiled children of Israel sometimes. I am sick of the blessing of God. Sick of it. Why? Because it's not what I wanted. Now, I don't know how you grew up, but I grew up the youngest of six. And there was eight in the house counting mom and dad. And by the way, my mom's sitting right here. She'll wave at me. That little lady. It's her birthday today, by the way. Happy birthday, mother. I get to say that because I'm the preacher and I'm up here. When I can tell you one thing, I didn't roll up to the dinner table and sit down with seven other people and say, I don't like that tonight. I mean, I would have gotten... Now, I mean, we didn't have time out back in those days. You know, time out was how long you were knocked out after dad got finished with you, somebody said. <laughs> that was time out back in our day. No, you just, you ate what you had, right? I mean, if you grew up in that same way, you grew up like I did. But God, have we ever, have I ever been sick of your blessings in my life? I wonder, have you ever thought about that? Have we ever just turned our nose up to the blessing of God because it wasn't what we wanted or what we thought we should have gotten out of life? And so God is trying to make a point. I'm going to help you day by day and meet your needs day by day. And this is the idea behind the line in the Lord's Prayer. Many of you know the Lord's Prayer. Jesus instructed the disciples how to pray. And he, and he says this line, give us this day our daily bread. Now, when he said that line in that prayer, those disciples around him, their minds instantly went back to the synagogue and their teaching and all the stories they heard about the children of Israel eating manna from God who had provided that blessing for them. And so when Jesus said, and say, give us this day our daily bread, they go back to the wilderness and say, wait a second. I would have said it this way because I grew up in church. I learned about that in Sunday school class. I learned about God giving them bread to eat. So now give us this day. He gave them every day their daily bread. Now Jesus is now saying, our Father would give you your daily bread every day that you need in your life. What's he saying? Not every day I'm going to wake up and I'm going to open the door and there's a loaf of bread laying there, but I will have blessings and mercy and compassion in my life. It's a spiritual parallel to a physical event that happened in the Old Testament. Oh, it's so beautiful to see all the the pages of God just come together like that. So we are never to live on yesterday's blessings. They are new every morning. God's blessings are never early, but they're never late. They are new every morning. Today's mercies, when you woke up today 
God has had mercies lined up for you, and God has compassion lined up for you, and God has blessings lined up for you. Those are for today and today's burdens and today's problems. And when you wake up tomorrow, guess what? There'll be a brand new set of compassions and mercies and blessings lined up for you tomorrow. They're for tomorrow. You don't get them today because they're for tomorrow. But when you need them, they'll be there. And it won't be late and it won't be early, but it will be right on time in your life. And I know it's hard to see it sometimes. Winston Churchill, the great prime minister of Great Britain, was going through a particularly difficult time during the war. And his wife was trying to comfort him and suggested to him something many of us have heard, that his trouble was really a blessing in disguise. You ever heard that one? Well, that's just a blessing in disguise. And Churchill looked at his wife and said, well, if that's true, it is very well disguised. And you've been there, haven't you? Sometimes you are there. Our problems and our troubles are real, and it's hard to see the blessing. We wonder what's going to happen tomorrow. We wonder if our health will hold up, or will we have a heart attack, or could we possibly have a sudden stroke? As we get older, we wonder, will we end up in a nursing home, or will we waste away in a hospital somewhere? We wonder about our children. What's going to happen with them? Will they serve the Lord? And if something happens to our children, who's going to take care of us in our old age? Single people wonder if they'll ever get married, and married couples wonder if they'll stay married. We have concerns about career choices and where we're going to be at in life in 10 years. God, help us to learn the lessons from Lamentations 3.23. God's mercies come day by day, by day, by day. Give us this day our daily bread. The mercies are lined up. The blessings are lined up. The compassions are lined up for you day after day, and they will come when you need them and not a moment earlier. And sometimes, you know what you got to do? Let me go back to this little piece of rope. Sometimes you got to tie a knot in the rope and just hang on and wait for the blessing to come, and wait for the mercy to come, and wait for the compassion to come. And say, you know what, God? I'm not letting loose. I'm determined to hold on. I'm determined to stand and see the salvation of God at work. I'm determined to stand and see my healing come. I'm determined to stand and see my blessing come. I'm determined to stand and receive my miracle. God, I'm not letting go no matter what happens in my life. I'm holding on to you. God gives us what we need today. If we need more, he gives us more. He gives us what we need when we need it exactly at that moment. If you will search your problems and look deep within them, I believe you will discover the well of the sky's mercy and compassion and blessing of God if you'll search for it. Finally, the last question we ask is, what is my hope for the future? Jeremiah gives us the answer. What is my hope for the future, God? Great is your faithfulness. That's my hope for the future. Great is your faithfulness. This is the text. This is the line that led Thomas Chisholm to write the poem that became our beloved hymn. Great is your faithfulness. Here's a simple way I can think of to kind of bring this truth into focus. Great is our fickleness many times in life. But great is the faithfulness of God. We may grow weary, but our God cannot grow weary. We may give up, but our God cannot give up. We may fluctuate, but our God is the same yesterday, today, and forever. We may disappoint ourselves and everybody around us, but our God cannot disappoint anyone. We may fail a thousand times, but our God cannot fail not even one time. God's faithfulness is so great that we can rest assured that when we come to the final bend of the road, that he will be there with us, helping us make the journey from this earth to that heaven. He is a faithful God. And I wonder this morning if you're living your life in such a way that when your funeral finally does come and there's some pastor standing over you talking about you, 
that it will be obvious to everyone gathered there that moment that you knew Jesus Christ as your personal Savior? Or will it be said that you lived for something else? This is our hope. This is our future, that our God is faithful, and we can trust him today, and we can trust him tomorrow, and we can trust him forever. Listen to these questions and answers again. Why doesn't God destroy me? Because of the Lord's great love, we are not consumed. How do I know God will keep on loving me? Because his compassions never fail. When will God give me what I need? He will give you what you need every day because his mercy and his compassion, his blessings are new every morning. And what is my hope for the future? My hope for the future is simply grounded in this, because great is his faithfulness. C.S. Lewis said it this way, he who has God and many other things has no more than he who has God alone. Think about that one. He who has God and many other things has no more than he who has God alone. As we have gathered here today, most of us here have many other things. We do. It may not be the biggest, brightest, shiniest, newest, fanciest, but we have many other things. If you don't believe me, Come to the church work day sometime. And let me take you to about three or four closets in this building. We have many other things. No, we don't have a clue where they came from. They just show up and they get put in there. Let me take you over the hill to our storage building. And let me show you the many other things that we have just on this church property. So many other things, we can barely get some of the doors closed on those bins. We have many other things. That many other things, for some, means money. For others, it means security. For some of you, it means friends and family. But do you have God in your life? You see, when you have God in your life, the many other things don't matter one way or the other. They just don't matter when you have God in your life. Because the person who has God and many other things is no better and has no more than the person who has God alone. And many other things will be gone one day. The Bible says at the end of the time, at the end of the age, everything will be burned up and consumed and gone. I can't tell you how many families I have been involved with over the years as a minister and mom died and dad died and now it's just the kids and they got everything and now they got to figure out what to do with it all and sister wants this and brother wants that and this brother wants this and this one wants that and they fuss and they fight and they feud and they get mad at each other and there's hurt feelings and they won't talk to each other for 20 and 30 years all because of a thing. A thing that can break, that can be stolen. That thing that was so important that you just had to have, you're gonna die one day. I mean, let's just be real here this morning. How about that? You're going to die and I'm going to die. And somebody's going to go through your stuff and your things. And what they're going to say, I want that old thing. Throw it in the trash. Sell it at the yard sale for a quarter for all I care. Take it to Goodwill. And you have lost your relationship with your brother or your sister or another family member or a friend all because of some stuff. Stuff's nice, nice to have. I got stuff, you got stuff. Got more stuff than I know what to do with my stuff. And I keep buying more stuff. The most important thing I have is God. He's it. He's it. You got to have money, you got to make a living, you got to pay the bills, yeah. But you got to have God. Because when all boils down to it, that's all that's going to matter. 
That's it. That's what life is about. It's about God. So today, I don't know where you're at in life. Maybe at some point you've asked all four of these questions that I've gone through this morning. Maybe you've asked all these questions at some point. Why doesn't God destroy me? How do I know God's going to keep loving me? When is God going to give me what I need? What is my hope for the future? And maybe you came in here discouraged and down and depressed, lost and wondering, where's God? Where is he at? Just remember, every now and then, he gives you a little tug. There he is. There he is. I go to work tomorrow, and that boss has been riding me. Most coworkers don't like me. I ain't sure I'll have a job after this week. Yeah, you know, where's God? And then, there he is. There he is. You're laying in bed. Nobody else is awake. Nobody else is around. And you're wondering, why, God? Why? Why has this happened? Why is this going on? I didn't see my life like this. Where is God? And all of a sudden, there's God. There's God. There he is. He's there. He said, I'll never leave you. And I'll never forsake you. I'll always be there. I'm always there. Why? Because he is a faithful God. Jeremiah gave us the answer to it. Great is your faithfulness. Great is it. I don't know this morning what you might need. I don't know what you might be going through. I sure don't want to embarrass anybody today. That's never my goal. I'm just going to ask you the simple question. If you need to feel the tug of God in your life about something, I want you to come down here right now. I just feel like I need to do it this way today. If you need to feel the tug of God about something, I need you to come right now. I don't know what it is, physical, emotional, spiritual, whatever. I just need you to come right now.